Grandma, I'm sorry. Hello and welcome to the Woodshed Podcast. <laughs> Don't fucking laugh. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> how dare you how dare you laugh during my podcast which i brought you on oh i'm the host andy brent <laughs> um so we're we're gonna be talking about uh, a somewhat sensitive topic today um we're gonna be talking a lot about drug culture today and i just like to say uh as a disclaimer the Woodshed Podcast does not condone the use of illegal substances or jazz um please do not do jazz because of us or because of any reason and also don't do drugs because of us or for any other reason unless they're prescription and they have been prescribed by a well-meaning doctor that you can trust heart all right so um our outro this week is going to be by albano the madman the man that has dis- disappointed so many people you uh if you've listened to the previous episodes you'll know him He's a, a frequent poster on Jam of the Week. He has a YouTube, just Albano the Madman, and a Facebook. And he sent, what is the name of this song? Open the Gate and Flood the Valley. That's also the name of the album it's on. Um, it's The album has like a lot of electronic elements to it. Uh, he plays a iwi for a lot of it, an electronic wind instrument. And I really fell in love with this particular song because it's very gritty the whole album's so gritty you can feel you can feel the grit (laughs) you can rub it against you can rub it against you it's like rubbing gravel it's great it's good gravel it's great on the toes (laughs) um on another note at the behest of my beloved grandmother and aunt i will (laughs) be (laughs) trying to restrict my use of the f word (laughs) As my grandmother did not appreciate that. So, that's just a small note. They told me they wanted me to say that. So, there we go. We are, I already screwed that up in the first 10 seconds of the intro, but don't don't mind it. No, that was my it's fault. All, it's all good. All right. So, I'm joined by four lovely people today. So, why don't you introduce yourselves? Just say your primary instrument and something fun about yourselves. I'm Daniel. I mainly play guitar. I also play flute, harmonic, a little bit of keyboards. And I mostly listen to jazz and prog rock. That's it, I guess. All right, my name is Donnie. Uh, My primary instrument are the piano slash keyboards, anything keys related. Uh, I've been a musician since I started taking lessons when I was six, and that's what I do now. And thanks for having me on. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tanner. Uh, I play the trumpet, and I yeah! spent the last four years uh, in school because I thought, you know, to make more money at music, I got to spend more money. And yeah, that's <laughs> not really working out. <laughs> Hi, my name's Tyler. Uh, I only play the, the, the piano you blow into, you know, the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I only listen to, uh, Jacob Collier, Bill Works, and Tiny Desk Concerts. <laughs> <laughs> Third time's a charm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, done. I was supposed to type that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. Um, I think it'd be good to go over a little bit of our, our use of drugs. Um, so I'm going to be the odd one out. Like I, like I was on the saxophone podcast. I have never had any type of recreational or illicit drug. I guess they're whatever. Um, because I have heart disease. Woo. So I'm a party everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I definitely can't have any stimulants, so I've never smoked. Um, I can't actually even have caffeine. I can only have about one bottle or one can of Coke before I start, like, dissociating. <laughs> I almost thought you said one caffeine. I, I had one, I've had a single caffeine. 
I really just had uh, the only thing I've ever done that was cool was I had one sip of a unnamed beer right the second I turned 21 um, because of peer pressure. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, so that's me. So I'm very excited to talk about drugs. Um, Anyone on the else can share their experiences or their their thoughts or whatever. I mean, I've done stuff. Hey mom, um, not not not. not <laughs> I drink a little bit, but not so much. I've done other things. Better left unsaid. Done. <laughs> cool. Thanks for coming on the podcast. <laughs> 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 I've done things, but I can't talk about it. Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Just silent oh. the entire episode. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, I mean, my history, I, my history of drug use is, I mean, at the point it's easier to, to corner it by asking questions than try to do a, a laundry list. Um, I, and I guess how it relates to jazz, I don't know. Has everyone here done like pot and alcohol at least? I don't know. We're, we're getting I, I, to that. I do jazz on a daily basis. I'm yeah. insane. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to yeah. quit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't quit. <laughs> jazz and none. Yeah, I think that's really all that needs to be said. Unless someone has like pressing, like they want to legalize heroin. One of my friends was saying, I was like, oh, don't. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, um, all right, well, one of the, the questions I kind of, I always ask myself. Wait, I didn't um, talk about my drug use. Oh, okay, okay, go, go, go. Uh, oh, It's only weed. <laughs> That's, yep. Okay, I'm good. You can, you can continue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, I mean, I think this is the most prominent question um, that's asked in relation to drugs. Um. What? How do you guys think it affects creativity or your ability to use? I mean, what your ability to play jazz or uh, just any type of music? Because I know uh, one of my friends was just saying um, he needs without Adderall, he cannot perform. He says it's just there's there's too much stuff going through his head, and he he needs it to perform. And I know other people are the other way. They say. You know, it's hard for me to sit down and practice, but my ideas are amazing when I'm off Adderall. Or, um, you know, a lot of heroin users say, oh, it's their creativity explodes. But then you also have guys, you know, like Clifford Brown, my brownie boy. Brownie. I, I love him. He's so good. He's such a good boy. Um, you know, he was clean all of his short life. And a lot of people were telling me, oh, that's he didn't live long enough to do to start using and I just brownie would never do that he was so pure um but like I mean the question is I was thinking about today you know if brownie had used heroin would he be a better player or would it like you know could it change the direction he was going in oh I think um I think that's definitely like a personality trait because like I can have, like, really good ideas, but, like, not with, like, I'm not going to do hard drugs or anything, but um, I had a combo gig recently where I had three drinks, and one was accidentally a double when I didn't order it, so I was feeling pretty good by the time I got up onto the bandstand, and it just, like, it didn't make me a better player, but it, like, it really opened up my ideas (laughs) that were already there. You thought you were a better player, though. (laughs) Oh, oh, it sure felt like it. (laughs) I think it just enhances what's already there. It doesn't, it's not like if you're a shit player, you're going to like all of a sudden just be amazing because you did heroin, Yo, you know? Well, I've never played under the influence, but I guess that it all comes down to the way, I mean, if you already have some skill in which with which you can express yourself when you're playing, when you're under the influence of a drug that just kind of changes the way you express yourself, I guess. Like... Different I'd, ways. I'd agree with that. That could make you more aggressive, more passive. That depends on the drug. I guess that's yeah the essence of it. I think in terms of creativity, it can definitely help. 
So, like, I've only had experience with the one, and I can say that in certain times it has led to some very nice ideas I would not have otherwise had. Like uh, the idea to make an hour-long percussion ensemble piece. Uh, but at at one point, uh, the there's a vocalist, and they take out their iPhone and just pull up, like, a, a bad piano app and hold that into the microphone and just play tritones while the the timpani player just, like, rubs his hand on the drum. Like, you know, you can just think of really weird things I would not have before. Those are all things I have written down on sheet music now. Yeah, perhaps that's just kind of, like, removing a filter that you have. Yeah. Of doing stupid shit. I mean... I I think yeah I I could just I think a lot of people would agree uh I just I it's hard because I can't share any personal experiences but like you know um I think when you're composing it would have the greatest effect so I know well it's been rumored and this is a poor example cuz it's not jazz but it it is like the first when I think like creativity if you want to expand your creativity with a drug, that would be like psychedelics or LSD. And that's mm-hmm. one of the things Tool kind of suggests they've done, or at least some of his other bands, uh, the bands Maynard Keenan's in. But um, yeah, I think, I think yeah. that's semi true. I, I think part of why jazz, I think is so susceptible to drug use, in the early days and still is, is the improvisational aspect at the same yeah. time. Like some drugs might make you more creative improvisationally, but it's like going to be really hard to compose on and, you know, vice versa. I, I think for me, that's kind of how, how it works is there's drugs I probably wouldn't compose on. Actually, that being psychedelics, like I prob like, from my experience, the influence of psychedelics is like after the experience. And maybe I'll record something, but like if you're on a bunch of psychedelics, it's very hard to like focus enough, honestly, to, you know, write a whole piece. Have I written things on it? Yes, but like it's it's different than I don't know, being high on weed or even if you take Adderall and being able to sit down and like write things out and having that focus. It's, it reminds me of that, that one artist. Um, I don't know his name, but he, I don't know how he even did this, but he's like, he has, he's a painter and he makes different paintings based on what drugs he's on. And he'll like, you know, meth is all like scratchy and like kind of terrifying oh, or like, yeah, I've seen yeah that. they're like different iterations of the same thing. I think and, he did self portraits sure of himself, right? They were yeah, self portraits. Yeah. And I'm sure actually a lot of that would be uh, expectations, you know, how you expect the drug is going to work is going to influence how you're going to do it. I mean, especially since I'm assuming this guy doesn't do all of these drugs like constantly. He just, you know, oh, look, I have a chance to do meth. I'll do it once and then paint. I mean, I don't even know how he, maybe he's just trolling us all. But it's like, like I mean, (laughs) that would be insane. The thing is, like with music, if you, if you've been doing it for years and I mean, you, it kind of comes out of you in the way like painting does, you can sit down on any drug and it's easier to maybe make that frame of reference, like. He has the limitations of a canvas and the fact that it has to be a self-portrait. If there is some way to do that on music, like I've done things like that, it's a great exercise. The problem is with music, especially on psychedelics, I've sat down and the fact that there's like almost limitless possibilities and you don't limit yourself is incredibly like overwhelming to where that's what's gotten in the way. The main thing on psychedelics is it, they make you unpredictable. So that's why yes. perhaps like you see the Grateful Dead jamming for 20 minutes on the same song. That's what helps them. Because if they weren't high on acid or I don't know what, they would probably stay doing the same thing over and over again. And that's maybe the use of drugs help them become less predictable and less repetitive because of a free-flowing... 
vibe or something. I don't know. When I kind of think of how it's like psychedelics work, I wouldn't like necessarily think about like performing while under the influence of them. I think of them more of like a transformative substance where it's after you've had the like experience, like it changes how you act in the future because of what went on. Yeah, that's definitely also a factor. And then again, there's all the psychedelic rock. I doubt that they they wrote all of the genre while being high on LSD. It's probably after the fact. Yeah. And yeah, I I feel like a lot of... Well, I don't know. I, I Really, I guess it just depends on what drugs for a lot of these effects. You know, what was... I don't know if he was high, but, um, you know, uh, uh, what Charlie Parker made that... What is that thing? He was drunk and drunk off his shit. Um, I can't remember the recording now. Ooh. Oh, when they were oh, holding just him up and down. Like, poking him with a pen to wake up in solo. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've always. But I, dr- I mean, I think he was drunk because he was trying to kick heroin, so he started drinking like an entire like fifth of you know liquor a day. Lover man. Nineteen forty six. Lover man. And it's like a lot of people regard that recording as like one of the. I mean, not one of his best, but like you know a very good recording in a way. And you know he said. Destroy it. Stomp it to the ground is what he said, if I recall correctly. Stomp it to the ground. Stomp it to the ground. But, like, do you think Charlie could have been as good as he was without using heroin? Is Charlie... Would Char- Charlie still be Charlie without the drugs? Um, I don't know if he would have been, like, as big of a part of it, because that's, like, one of that big the big things that Gary Bartz talks, talks about is what, like... Um, it was a community, like, if you weren't doing it, you wouldn't hang out with them, like, the people that were doing it were the ones that were the most visible, so, like, if you weren't involved in heroin, like, I don't, I, they, they didn't really want you there. Yeah, I think the drug use attests more to his personality, because if he wouldn't have done it, perhaps he wouldn't have been what he was, but other people, let's say Frank Zappa, were also very creative without ever using drugs so i think maybe to some personalities it is better to indulge a little bit on that side of the spectrum and for others it would just hinder the the creativity i think it's important too when you're like doing it in a scene like like charlie parker was and gary bartz mentioned um and to connect it back to like the psychedelics and like a lot of you know, present day, you know, like rock or improvisational, like jam music or tool, like there for Mike's, I actually have played a live show on, on psychedelics and it's incredibly easier when like I did it one once with a, everyone in my band was, we were all where it was this, we were in the same boat and it made it, you know, the vibe a certain way. And I've done that with other drugs too. And I think you know, jazz back in the day was shaped by, like, that community where maybe everyone wasn't doing heroin, but there was that, like, party aspect, you know. People were doing cocaine back then, too, you know. People were drinking, and it when everyone's doing it around you and the musicians on stage, like, even if the music's super loose because you're all, you know, on smack, you can kind of, like, vibe together in this way. I, I don't know how to describe it, really. It's like they're in tune with each other yeah i i mean it makes it it's if you have the same perspective or a similar or at least a similar starting point uh and honestly my own experience even just smoking weed on a gig if i like get hired for a quartet or something or people i'm not familiar with and i don't know like i don't feel comfortable really going being under the influence of anything while if i'm like with buddies or people i know and i maybe i'm with my group and we're all sharing a joint like beforehand uh it's just a much more comfortable space um you know and that's that's like and once again we do not condone drug use but at the but that's like some drug uses i know it's that they advise you should always be in the company of people you trust yeah when 
doing substance. So that kind of plays into that. Makes Especially sense. for like first time uh, moments. I, I think a good question yeah. for too is how many maybe great jazz players might have gotten vibed out in the 30s because they were straight. I mean, Clifford Brown is one example of someone that didn't, but, uh, you know, there weren't, there really aren't that many guys that were like Clifford, you know, Brownie that were. So that's a good question, I guess. Uh, I know Sonny Rollins was inspired by Brownie to stop, um, who... As far as I know, Don Ellis didn't do anything. But uh, Sun Ra uh, was, he had a full drug free band, and his shit was whack. Um, I mean, like crazy, crazy shit. Yeah, yes. And uh, I mean, that I, that's one of the good examples. It's just, you hear a lot more, I think, about people who have done the drugs. You know, they say, oh, he was. I don't know. There's a lot of like, you know, there's a huge gray area. There's people who have for sure done it and done drugs. And then there's like a gray area, like, did this person? I don't know. Uh, they just, it's not like said explicitly. I remember Chet, speaking of which, for, before I forget, I've been, I've been thinking, you guys are talking about a, uh, like, uh, like a, I don't want to, like an in-group, like, uh, hey, you cannot hang with us if you're not using. It reminds me um, of Born to be Blue, the Chet Baker biopic, which, by the way, I disliked heavily. Um, reminds me, you know, it's this, this, he looks so, he, it's, it's good because when Chetty was young, he looks so innocent and like, oh yeah, he looks like a kid. And I remember in the film, and I'm I'm pretty sure this happened in real life too. But like, he would always look over at Miles and Dizzy. And he's like, "Please accept me." <laughs> oh. And then when he finally does get accepted, is when he starts using again. Well, um, at least in the movie. But that also reminds me of a funny story in uh, the Let's Get Lost documentary, which was also about Chet Baker. And that's yeah. a documentary. It was all right. Gosh, it was it was morbidly funny. Um, so. <laughs> at the very end of the film and this was made a couple months before his death i believe but they released it after his death and they chose to put this part at the end of the film they're like so uh so chet what's your favorite drug <laughs> and he's like oh yeah i like i like speedball which is a i think it's a mixture of heroin and cocaine and some other stuff <laughs> and it's like a few weeks later, Chet Baker jumped out of his three-story window. Oh it's like, holy God. shit. <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure if that juxtaposition was necessary. Yeah, well, there are a lot of people that think that he didn't even jump out of his window. They think he owed a lot of people too much money. He and flew. Yeah, he... No, he didn't even think that. They, like, they're, like... A lot of people think it's a cover-up, and they think just people broke in like borrowed money from the wrong people and they threw him off the balcony. Oh my gosh. I mean that did happen before, you know, they he got his teeth punched out. Yeah. Which in the in the Born to be Blue, I can't remember why, but I remember laughing hysterically when it happened. Yeah. It was like oh, some like you owe me money, yeah. bitch. And it's just <laughs> a quick just swipe. Instead of a bowling alley and they beat the shit out of him for no reason. Also, quick mention from the only part I liked about that film, besides actually the the ending was pretty all right, but like my favorite line that whole film, he's with his girlfriend at the time, and he goes back to his father's farm, and I think he's trying to like quit. And he's walking with his girlfriend down a big open, you know, a big field, and she's like, "Man, must have been lonely with no brothers and sisters on this farm." And his his response is, "Yeah, but I had my trumpet." <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was crying. That, that's he also funny talks very strangely. It sounds like he's been. There's, you know what? I actually kind of, kind of reminds me because I, I didn't, I had never studied Monk in depth yet, but I was watching some interviews, and you know he's like, in the older age, you can barely understand him, and I mean that might be because of the drugs and. Well, they think that is. Also, Chetty talks like a baby a lot of the time. 
Monk <laughs> had mental like issues. Like his wife took care of yeah. him as he got older. Uh, uh, it seemed like a similar thing happened to him and Bud Powell. Those older like, you know, the guys that like were around for Stride, but then also helped birth Bebop. Like it seemed like they they didn't do a ton of smack like a lot of the later Bebop guys like Parker did, but just like drinking made them insane. I don't know. I think just alcohol too that early, like, you know, like they were around when prohibition was around and people were just making shitty liquor. And, you know, I, I really do. Yeah. So many of those guys like ended up in, yeah, with their just losing their minds before their bodies from drinking. So you got to wonder. With like course cough syndrome is a big one. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and then Monk also had, I, I mean, based on what I mean, what I've read, which is, I mean, pretty little, but I, I think it's pretty obvious that he had bipolar. I mean, based on my background, because for for anyone that that doesn't know, I'm I have a I almost almost have a degree in both neurobiology and now I'm getting a degree in psychology, but I, I'd say pretty certain from what i read that he had pretty severe bipolar disorder and i there's some nah, i don't want to misquote i feel like there was some medication he took that was not good for him but anyway can i go on a tangent about uh religion and spirituality with drugs sure cool all right so uh going back to like psychedelics and whatnot i do believe that there are many people that don't identify as religious, but identify as, like, spiritual. Like, they feel like there is, like, some big picture, some great meaning out there. And a lot of people like to channel that feeling through music because some of the... Again, I'm not religious, but, like, I do enjoy a lot of religious music because a lot of it is composed uh, for, like, not for money, not for... To, to get famous, but, like, for worship, for, like, their religion. So, like, a lot of it can be, like, extremely beautiful, and like, if with, like, the meaning behind it. And uh, I know that drugs are involved in, in some religions, some cultures, like that, to achieve that, to as in, like, a guide to help achieve that spiritual place. Hence why people take psychedelics or whatnot. So it's, like... A, it's like double enhancing music if you if you're making it both for religion and that religion involves drug use this is just something on my mind and i thanks. mean re- i mean really to counter your argument though I'm what not, i'm not arguing <laughs> what ja- you know, what jazz what jazz musician makes music for Ooh. money we're all dirt poor there we go um, except for uh it's interesting. They, they always said Miles. They always said My, Miles quote. I had a quote with Miles. I think it's from actually. Uh, he didn't say it. It was. It's in the uh, the film about 1959, the year that changed jazz. Oh, and our uh, one of our favorite tunes was released then. Uh, take five. Anyway, <laughs> um, th- they said about Miles. You know, he could he could walk off the stage if people were making noise and being rude and just say, fuck that, I'm not dealing with that. And he's like, that's because he had the money. <laughs> we don't, all these other guys are like, we don't have the money to do that. Well, yeah. Anyway. I it, Speaking of Miles too, and then the psychedelic thing, Miles, I think, t- talking about Coltrane, he said once Coltrane started making, um, uh, you know, uh, Love Supreme and that kind of stuff, He's uh, Coltrane actually started getting this like huge hippie following because it was like around that time that there was that you know that was a popular thing and people were doing psychedelics and like that kind of music that like modal just kind of staying at one you know one or two chords for a long time but getting really out and free with it was uh I mean that's kind of too what like the Dead were doing and what Bitches Brew like did. A little bit it's it, it's you know there has to be a a line between psychedelics and why all that was happening yeah um like there going back to the money and that sort of thing like 
Phil Leshen. I don't know if you guys know who that is, but he was like a um, music publisher um, from New York. And he was saying that like the heroin never improved anybody's music, but it did numb their pain, like the pain of non-recognition and not having money. And then whatever money Probably they did have. Probably racism and yeah. all that, too. Oh, exactly. And then whatever money they did have, they just spent on more heroin. And, like, Red Rodney, trumpet player, said that heroin was the badge yeah. that made beboppers different from the rest of the world. So, mm-hmm. like, there's a whole group of thinking there where, like, they think the only thing that sets them apart is that heroin. And then you have people like Clifford Brown that, like, didn't need to touch it once. Hmm. Are you, are you like are you like flipping through your 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 thesis statement? <laughs> My whole doctoral thesis. No, it's just like whenever you guys say something, it just seems super relevant to just like a single quote, and it just like, like it's funny how like hearing you guys with like the natural flow of this like discussion, how just like it brings up every like notable point about the argument of drugs and jazz music. This just so do you me guys? Realize I don't know shit about jazz. <laughs> <laughs> um do you guys think uh d- 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 what is i gonna say that like how when you think is the image of jazz still like you know kind of strongly related to drugs in today because i mean i don't know i don't really sure yeah i can't really think of any big things i've heard of drug users getting busted um in today's jazz except for roy hargrove who got um busted last year for cocaine possession i remember he's like oh man i feel so stupid (laughs) or something like that um but i think yeah it was roy hargrove the i i have some things to say about him but that's save that for another episode (laughs) Um, so do you guys think it's still like a prominent thing? I th- I would say, you know, one of the big things, so we have, you know, we have the, the woodshed artwork actually done by Daniel here. So woo, shout outs to him. But, um, we were talking about adding a cigarette to a, like an animated cigarette to the, yeah, and smoke. the video and smoke and I decided I ultimately decided against it because um I just I you know don't want to condone drug use but like also you know that's the first thing and that I when I made that decision that was a way later I was like immediately I was like yeah whenever I think of like a jazz club or anything I think of someone smoking sitting in the back in front and back of a round table with a glass of like whiskey and just holding you know the cigarette like out and just like smoking right you guys yeah, know what i mean i get like that image especially with like cool jazz definitely with cool yeah. jazz but nowadays i think the whole world has changed drugs aren't as as i don't know as i think of the youth like it was before now it's very widespread everybody does pot everybody's yeah. cigarettes are way different drug. now too yeah like, and in the fifties, like, there was such a huge campaign for cigarettes that yeah, literally mm-hmm. everyone was smoking. Yeah, them. and nowadays we know cigarettes cause cancer, and we have more studies on everything. So and it's more, I don't know, it's less glamorous to smoke cigarettes, I guess. Yes, that's okay. That I was trying to think of the right word. That's I think the primary yeah. change but, that's happened. It's very it's not really glamorous to yeah, smoke now it's cigarettes all about at all vape. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the future of jazz is vape. <laughs> oh my god. No, <laughs> no, no. no, no. <laughs> um yeah, I, I think, think the the torch <laughs> during your during your solo, just dude, check out this huge vape cloud. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow the cloud and I'm gonna play in it. It'll be sick, dude. I'm no, bro, 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 bro. I'm serious. Hey guys, this is gonna I just be got this so new vape. Good. Check it out. <laughs> it sounds, it's, it's, there's oh. your two. There's your two uses. You don't get another one. Okay. No, um, I think like next like, out. Talking, yeah, talking about like like drug use and different music genres. Like I think like jazz is really where that kind of like took root, and then like it kind of got passed to like heavy metal or like hair bands like that type of metal and then like now like if you think about current day it's all like music festivals and like 
EDM music and house music and like really like the psychedelics are really starting to take hold as like the drug of choice for music genres. Yeah, I think like electronic and ED- that and this is an interesting too thing too is I think that type of music developed around a primary drug being like ecstasy and MDMA and other psychedelics as well, but I know like yeah it's it is kind of similar to a lot of jazz developing when you know heroin was big i think now though you know i think heroin is just completely on the out like i think people still do it obviously it's a problem because there's still you know opioid overdoses are through the roof but i think the heroin crisis yeah i i don't think it's jazz musicians really doing it because i think i i think <laughs> uh first of all it's super expensive it's more expensive than you know weed or psychedelics or even cocaine and it's not really like Mm -hmm. a party drug like the the jazz musicians in the scenes that i know where people do do drugs um you know regardless of type of jazz no one wants to you know get knocked out on a couch when they're partying they'd rather do ecstasy or (laughs) cocaine or even like smoke some weed you know so I think heroin and music, it's still around, you know, especially people get addicted to painkillers. That's how it's done now instead of like through the scene. But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see it at least. Now, I see people doing cocaine and, and tons of other drugs, but I don't ever see heroin in jazz or music festivals or any of that really. You know, I I think a lot of that is also because the jazz scene has changed. You know, if I if I think about like bebop settings, hard bop, you know, they back in the fifties and sixties, you know, they had shows. They had jazz six two five and soupy sales and some other shows. You know, and you'd be playing for like you know the audience would be there for you. There'd be a huge audience, and it's been. Um, and the, you know, it's a quiet audience, you know, being respectful where, well, I mean, it, it's a different, you mm-hmm. know, they're, they're yeah. quiet, but, um, or like, you know, in Chet Baker's case, I know some of his later shows and I, I, I would say that's really common of a lot of cool jazz, but it's played at like a, a bar, like a venue, you know, where you're still supposed to be kind of quiet. Um. And, you know, I think heroin is, when I think of heroin, like the using heroin, I mean, I think more calming uh, and not like ecstatic. So now go f- f- fly forward to uh, this day and age. If if you even have a jazz concert, if you are lucky enough, at least in the States, you know, eh, you might, I I think a lot of, what am I trying to say? You know, like a lot of new groups like Moon Hooch, um, some more like mixed bands, you know, that play S- funk or snarky some kind of more puppy, exciting you know, music. They play Snarky, snarky puppy. puppy plays tons of festivals. Or used to. Nowhere like, is my favorite yeah, jazz. Well that, Nowhere that's too. the point. Yeah. It's more festivals. So we have these festivals where um th- I mean th- that's the key word, festival. Everyone's kinda you can have a fucking mosh pit if you want. It's it's much more energetic, so I think you kind of have to change the drugs. I'd love to. It's not changing the, the drugs to fit the music. It's just that the music now is fitting fitting with the uh, the audience. So now you have to fit your drugs with that kind of music yeah. now. So I think that would kind of uh, change what type of drugs are being used. Well, you can look at the '70s the in that regard too. Like the '70s was the rise of like cocaine and disco, but then you also have Return to Forever, Mahi Vishnu, Weather Report, you know, Herbie's Headhunters. Uh, the list goes on. These electric, you know, f- acts that are doing more funk and and even even with like groups like Mahi Vishnu and Return to Forever, they're not necessarily funk, but it's this very aggressive music that just to me it sounds like cocaine like it just sounds like being on cocaine yeah Yeah. but i mean nowadays um for example coachella banned drugs this year and also there's this jazz festival here in panama that 
it's not very jazz fusiony. It's more like very old school jazz. And you see the people playing, and it's definitely not the same as it was before. Now, I mean, if you think of jazz music musicians in the 50s, you think, I don't know, Miles, you think Coltrane. And nowadays, it's people like us, just white teenagers. <laughs> us. Yeah. Oh, that We're sucks. the future of Adam jazz. Neely. I, to come, I think, the future of jazz to come. I think jazz, it's just kind of diversified, <laughs> you know? Like, there's so many people playing different kinds of jazz. Like, yeah, there's the Roy Hargroves, but then there's also some straight-edge people. And and it also begs the arg argument of which is jazz and which, like, because like, some people are like, snarky puppy, who cares if everyone's doing drugs at their concert? They're not jazz. or, But, you know, I'll go... And see, like Brad Meldow play with his trio, and it's straight up. <laughs> no one's doing drugs. But then I'll go see him play with Mark Juliana and his Meliano electric duo, and like half the crowd's rolling. So it's like, it's a very weird thing. It kind of depends on the music. That reminds me of like me when I discovered nowhere trying to like tell my other friends, no, this is jazz. This is jazz. Yes. I swear. Yeah, because I'm I... like, so I'm like, they'll catch on. They'll bite on to this because it sounds pretty hip, you know, butts and tits and money. Yes. yes. I'm like, yeah, I like, I, all of my, my friends will want to listen to that because they're trash. <laughs> they don't listen to hard bop. And I'm like, I'll slowly corrupt them and get them to listen to hard bop through this. <laughs> but it's like, Honestly, I what did someone said? I, I believe it was, I won't say his full name, but Eric, I believe said, told me, um, <laughs> gosh, oh shit. What did he say? Something like, uh, the more, the more you love jazz, like the more, stuff you want to be jazz like you you say i this is jazz because you just want to open profound. you, you want to i wish i could i have to find the, the original quote yeah i think that's exclusive to young jazz shit posters because i know some old motherfuckers that are very tight on their definition no yeah i agree I, I'm the um, same way, though. No, I I'll, think there's no question. I'm, you know, I'm willing to overlook many things to be like, you know what? They're trying. They have a ninth on that chord. They're trying. <laughs> <laughs> there's a nine in there. <laughs> it's like that Lou. I just I just looked it up today. It was Lou Reed that said uh, one chord is rock is that what he said and then two chords is like well uh, wow i just screwed up the entire quote doesn't yeah. matter the quote i hate it but it's like one jet one chord is rock two chords is kind of crazy and three chords is jazz haha -ha, funny meme it's i forgot where i was going with this i got Simon so Franklin? frustrated about how much i hate that quote <laughs> or like man i th well uh, lou yeah, reed that's that, that's going into another topic lou reed did heroin so he he's jazz that is true it's such a perfect day wow i fucked that up too just gonna I don't anyway think um Collier has ever done anything stronger than orange juice <laughs> 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 I don't it know. feels weird to know that he's older than me. That's weird. Yeah, he's Drink like 23. Yeah. Drinking but, uh, age in oh man, the UK. Is, I, I isn't suggest... it 16 or 18? So. Probably. Depends on... He's Ken. He's <laughs> Ken. Depends on where you are. I, highly... I don't know why I'm talking. I'm an American. <laughs> I highly suggest uh, listening to the, the very first thing he uploaded on YouTube. I believe the year you uploaded it, he was like 15 or something. It's just really experimental uh, electronic. There's like some like backwards vocals in there. He sounds like an infant. It's great. I love infant music. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll check it out. Everyone check out the infant music called, by Jacob. It's called Serendipity. Make sure you... you uh, sounds pretty bad, honestly. <laughs> make sure you... Uh, 
you you guys spread this podcast around so we can get the big boy Jacob Collier on our podcast. We are also talking about though what we really want a lot more would be Jacob Satorius. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's done more for jazz than <laughs> the anyone Jacob else Collier. I know. Oh. My vote's still for Jacob, <laughs> yeah. man. Oh yeah, we have to I climb can, the ladder. We could Jake. Him. We could actually get Jacob Man on here. I think. And then we can get Jaco Pasta, Jaco Pasta. Yes, and then he's and then you know Jacob number two, and then Jacob Callier. Yeah, an episode full of Jacobs. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, I have an entire episode of Jazz Jacobs. Jazz Jacobs. Oh wait, the well, double yeah. J's. Jacob Satorius can be the host, <laughs> which reminds me, um, uh, if you guys, I should have said this in the beginning, but for all of our listeners, if you've noticed, uh. My mic quality has probably been really bad. And that's because your boy here, Andy Brent, does not own a microphone. <laughs> I was uh I have been leeching off my roommates, uh, and my roommate is not available this week, so I'm using my headset. So if you guys wanna wanna help the Andy boy out, you... please donate to my Patreon. Maybe one Venmo day me. he'll sound as good as my mic. Do it. Which now and... if you if and, I'll, and in reference I'll, to his, I'll make it, I'll make great rewards. I'll I'll I have no idea what you guys want from me. <laughs> Venmo I me I make Jazz memes on the internet. That Andy Brent. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll send you each a personalized lick. But um, I don't know if I want that. <laughs> 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 you already know. You already know. Um, Can you? Yeah, I'm. I I cannot wait for. For the Adam, the Adam Neely to come on. I cannot wait for that day. That will, well, maybe come. He's talked to me a couple of times in private message, and he likes my posts, so Ooh. that's cool. Um, gotta, anyway, anyway I had you already know to hey. the lick. Um, that's Andy, the next meme. Andy, we're not supposed to talk about the group. I I I own the podcast. <laughs> I <would do> that. <laughs> just didn't want to go into full detail. Player. Anyway. Anyway, um, I have a quote here, and this isn't really related too much to jazz. I mean, well, too much to drugs, excuse me. What's the difference? Um, same thing, same but, thing. But I, I kind of wanted to know your guys' thoughts on this, because I think about this quote a lot. So the first quote comes from uh, a sort of jazz boy, uh, Tom York of Radiohead. Ah, uh, yes. And he says... I think the most important thing about music is the sense of a, of escape. Now, in contrast, uh, Charles Mingus says, if someone is has been escaping reality, I don't expect him to di dig my music. So I kind of wanted to get probe your guys' destroyed, like jazz destroyed minds <laughs> of your thoughts on this. Because like, yeah, I well, I mean, especially in like Radiohead's music, you know, um, like some of the crazy, the wackier ones, like er everything in its right place, and uh, what's the other one? Idiotech, which coincidentally I played both the jazz arrangements of it. And despite what everyone says, I rather enjoyed that. Oh, I played um, everything in its right place. I played that arrangement too. Yeah, it was it was fun, especially well, as a high school group. But, you know, I think I think you can get in a mood where if I'm in a certain mood, I just kind of want to escape reality. You know, I want to listen to something and be fully immersed in the music. And I mean, there's other reasons, too. You can have not to sound cliche, but you can have music transport you to another place. But like when I. And that's some of the stuff I try to do with my own music. I try to make a, a, like a new world. I, I want to bring someone in to what I'm making. But I kind of also understand, you know, if you are someone who uses music to escape reality, I mean, you're, you're going to be missing some stuff, especially since, you know, Charles Mingus in the era of bebop and hard bop, a lot of that, especially like uh, hard bop, you know, it came a lot of saying, about the struggles at the time you know it's very in a lot of cases very aggressive it has like a kind of red and orangey gritty color to it yeah i mean um, plus it's jazz's blues 
jazz's roots in the blues i mean so many of the the songs you find you know in in the real book like are you know either a ballad where you're supposed to make people feel sad the blues that way or if it's an uptune you know you're still you know minor or major blues are still kind of providing those like emotions and i guess it depends on like if you view an escape as creating a world like radiohead would or i don't know because someone could you could argue that immersing yourself in like the blues or trying to feel that emotion is an escape in itself but i guess there's two ways of looking at it you can look at it from the listener's point of view and from the artist the artist could be escaping himself or he could create something but in the end it's all the same they're creating like an aesthetic proposal and then there's the people that listen to it you could escape to something that wasn't created to be escapism because you have your own way of listening to it and that i mean that could you could see it in as an example in painting people they they are very realistic paintings and you have their purpose that is to mimic reality and there are others i don't know if you've seen them rothko he makes like he throws paint he makes squares and shit and people say that when they see his paintings they get transported to different realities that may or may not have <laughs> been <laughs> his original purpose but it happens so it's really strong terminology yeah <laughs> it is have... many people have fallen anyway sorry to rothko so yeah it... <laughs> they, they look at the painting and their their eyes just roll back in their head like no no janet no yeah that another one so yeah that's it depends on how you look at it but i guess it's very a matter of perspective i like the idea of like uh it's like how you consume uh literature like people enjoy reading books because it's like bu- uh describing like a fictional universe and like it's telling a story and creating this world it's not like an escape from reality it's just like experiencing a different one so like uh oh, yeah. it's very like like artists like igloo ghost which is 100% jazz uh it's it's like this People describe it in so many different ways, like kinetic jelly, hyperdimensional aliens flying through uh, eyeballs. I don't know. <laughs> but then again, and it's when it's you like weirdly like it. it go on. Okay, it, it like weirdly fits when you listen to it, and it's like a very. I just I really like Igloo Ghost. I I listen to that album, and it's like wow, this is good. Also, good drug music, because <laughs> this is also the drug podcast. But. but you were saying uh, yeah when people create or listen to like different alternative realities to escape to or not to escape to or just to experience them there's always the factor that every reality that is that is created by someone is also deeply rooted in our reality even no matter how outside it may seem there's always a certain influence it's impossible to escape it so i mean <laughs> It's all a reflection on what happens to us and on what we listen. I, I love it almost it almost sounds like you're about to go into like a really theoretical we can get really existential. Uh are are a like thing of like multiple realities or like parallel universes. Yeah. That's why String I was String theory. I I genuinely believe in a hyperdimension hyperdimensionalism dimensionality. None of these are real words, but, like, I do believe in, like, other dimensions. Like, we live in the third dimension, straight up. That's, we only exist in those three dimensions. There's definitely a fourth dimension. I thought dimension. we lived in the fourth dimension. No, we live in the third. Because if we, if we live in the fourth, we live in the fourth dimension um, because the time is, keeps moving. I hate the theory that time is the fourth dimension. Time oh, I will fight this. Shit. We're gonna, like, we're gonna have we're gonna have some problems because I'm that was my major almost. I was gonna be a theoretical mathematics What's major, and I, I wrote. I believe I in made species proofs. in the other spatial dimension 
they could pass through our third dimension, but that's like us passing through a second dimensional world, a flat world, the well, flat land the, theory. Yeah, there's, I'm just, I'm going to say, we, we I'm going to find... say, I'm just going to say, I wrote the proof. I made proofs about fourth dimensions and whatnot. And then I freaking read Flatland, and it had the same exact proofs yeah. and diagrams in I it. And that was one of my favorite moments in it. Single handedly proving that the fourth dimension is based on spatialism and not time. Anyway, Murph, to get us back <laughs> on track, um, how do we apply hyperdimensionality to jazz? Oh, I'm pretty sure Sun Ra has already done this, actually. I, th- I think Jacob Cole is uh, uh, level take five. Just um, kidding there. Dimension He's... five. Jacob Collier is prying open my third eye. See, gonna, imagine though there. if Jacob Collier or Sun Ra both took drugs though. Together? We don't know if they have. But that, yeah, that was my original question. Yeah. I'm I'm just asking you to imagine it. Oh, okay. so- sounds fun. <laughs> Jacob Collier doesn't do drugs. Drugs does does Only Jacob. Only It was hard to get out. Drugs, drugs do get Jacob. Oh wow! Drugs does wow. Jacob. Drugs do Jacob. Jacob. Yeah. Jacob doesn't do I drugs. Love, usually, drugs does I love Jacob. the That's image. Okay. Usually, what I hear is music. I just imagine him doing drugs. That's the other world it takes me to. What about? I, I love the uh, the image of him just drinking orange juice <laughs> before every show, or like in the middle of shows, he just has like a bottle of orange juice and just swigs it real quick, and then goes back. Ah! Orange juice is not good for the throat. It's very it's very acidic. <laughs> but if he was neurotic, Maybe that's his secret. Water. What influences you to make negative oh, really? time signatures? Oh shit. <laughs> oh, I haven't watched. I actually. What kind uh, of drug does that? <laughs> I have that. I haven't watched that video, but it's on my, my playlist. My watch later. I can't wait. You don't watch them as soon as they come out. <laughs> you don't have <laughs> bell notifications on. Dude, you did. You, yeah, you gotta. Oh. You gotta to subscribe. Adam yeah, you gotta subscribe if you want them yeah. to come on. Subscribe By the way, the Adam Neely, please. I'm here. Subscribe to the woodshed and I'll make you famous. Mm. I remember one of my <laughs> first videos I made on my own YouTube channel. It's like, hey, it was like a tutorial video. It's like, hey, you want to learn how to make a, a shit post? Want to get a um, huge amount of subscribers? Like, uh, I can't remember. I put like Jacob Mann, maybe. And then like, Adam Neely and it said like 200,000 subscribers at the time and then like me for a split second and it just says 37 in like the smallest text. <laughs> it was like big YouTubers like me. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I have um, 23 subscribers. Oh shit, you're catching up to me. I'm, I'm eating a Starburst right now. Uh, my most you... viewed YouTube video is like this weird piano improvisation on the Ghostbusters theme and that has 20,000 views. Damn. I only have a couple hundred. I have a video of me playing a Mozart song on on guitar like 10 years ago. And it has 300 views. Nice. Shout out shout outs to to all of our YouTube channels from all of our guests. And I I just like to make it clear that if you want if you want your music to be famous, if you want to have more subscribers, you, you know, you just send me that message and I'll get you on the woodshed. Yeah, SoundCloud, <laughs> soundcloud.com slash T-Y-L-E-R-J-O-N-S-I. Follow me. Buy my album on Bandcamp. <laughs> it's Bandcamp.com slash T-Y-L-E-R-J-O-N-S-I. I actually do have a SoundCloud. Are we doing though. plugs now? Is it is it plugs oh, time? Oh my no gosh. What we're, we're doing? No, no <laughs> plugs. Stop. Stop it. If you, you want to plug your Jacob shit, Paul you can talk to me later. We can only <laughs> plug so many people. I've already already plugged someone. So speaking about plugging, uh, oh shit! I'm I I. I don't how about that any. segue? How about that segue? <laughs> <laughs> so speaking about so talking about segues, kind of like jazz, right? It's really it's really cool, but not really. It's only white guys do it now. These <laughs> <Like> podcasts. <laughs> oh, oh, shit. Geez. From London, um, 23 years old, named Jacob. 
We uh, we got any? We have any more to talk about? We could do. I mean, there's a lot more we could talk about. We could do funny jazz drug stories that we've read about. I don't know. Not to, oh, not anyone that this, isn't this, already printed in books like Miles Davis or people, you know. Oh my gosh! I just immediately, you, you, I could just I just see a young Miles Davis almost crying, looking, trying to stick his head out the window while Charlie Parker gets his fried chicken sloppied <laughs> over while he's eating <laughs> fried chicken. <laughs> in the was it a it was a taxi i think they're in the back Gosh, of the that taxi. story yeah no charlie parker was getting yeah. ahead at the and time just... and he was to- told miles like <laughs> fucking stick your head out the window boy like what are you doing <laughs> he's like he's like does this bother you boy and miles was like i imagine him like shaking because he was really young i imagine him shaking like yeah I, i'm kind of feeling a little uncomfortable with what you're doing with that girl you know <laughs> You know, get, do an oral and also eating the fried chicken. And he said something like, "Well, you could stick your head out the window." <laughs> it's like, holy shit! What? It's like, holy happening? shit! I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> is, this is this true? Is that what? Th- that is a hundred percent. That was true. the day. That was the... according to Miles Davis. I, it's it's more was just it's more graphic than that. Jesus, that is in his that was the autobiography. Day Miles became a man. I don't read about jazz musicians. Oh, you should. Miles is it's good. It's so though. entertaining. It's in his voice, so like you'll Ma- see it printed out, just like I looked at that job, motherfucker. Like it's just <laughs> written in his voice. He's like, he's yeah. Like, he's like, you white motherfucker! I swear. Dio, <laughs> Dio, book the fucking gig. <laughs> Uh no, Miles is great. He kicked hair on um, twice. Jazz drug stories. Uh well, well, there's also the other story of Miles' different drug in in the seventies when he was rich as fuck and dropping like something absurd like five hundred dollars on cocaine like a day. He's he apparently he had a Ferrari too. Yeah, he would just get coked up and drive that around at like 3 a.m. and apparently he'd get so crazy from doing so much blow one time he was like digging in his backyard looking for something because he heard voices and then i think his girl at the time who's on the front of um i think someday my prince will come was like basically like miles what the hell are you doing and he kind of stood up and was like i don't know and just threw this shovel aside and like ran back inside nah. so i think a good rule of thumb is never get that deep into drugs if you're doing them although none of us are going to be as rich as 70s miles davis you don't know you don't know jazz is going to come back i swear <laughs> you got the hey you I'm going to be rich off this podcast. You got the Patreon. You know how much money I've made? You know how much money I've made off this? <laughs> I've I've gone into debt $30. <laughs> if we just buy everyone heroin, then maybe Jazz will come back. You know, Damn. I don't think we should True? I don't think we should push Jazz to be in the mainstream anymore. I think we should go back further, back to like uh, the Baroque period, like those guys were the rock stars. <laughs> Just start over again. But Bach made jazz. <laughs> she posting of class- yeah, uh, pretentious classical. Shout out to pretentious classical music elitists. Shout out <laughs> to uh, Rick Beato. Right before this thing I watched, he had a video that was said Bach and Charlie Parker both did this, and it was, uh, I don't know, it was cool. talking drugs. about just some of the lines they made. Drugs. Was it heroin? Yeah. <laughs> oh, what drugs did classical composers take? They, <laughs> they both did drugs Meth. and got. Low jobs from Crocodile. The drug of crocodile. Oh no, th- this is actually a real thing. This is a real thing. Um, there are a lot I'm of sure composers that did um opium, and it's like not as well documented oh, yeah. because obviously like you can't document stuff as well back then. But like, I've read a lot of things on this where like there are composers that like have done like crazy out there things that didn't make it that popular because of how like locked down they were on things back then. But like a lot of painters too, like. Like did opium a shit ton. Yeah, a lot of people tend when they think about heroin classical music, opium. they think of old people and doing and just sitting at a concert hall, but they forget like people like Franz Liszt, that was, it, it was a life mm. of excess, like everyone would 
love him. He was the first Beatle, I guess. He would like he was the first. smoke a cigarette, drop it on the street, and women would come to take his cigarette. To pick it up for him? <laughs> no, <laughs> smoking <laughs> themselves. I think Debussy drank a lot, crazy. too. <laughs> They'll just, everyone will know. Everyone will know. I think it'll be obvious. We don't have to state it explicitly. Anyway, um. Okay. Anyone have drug stories to talk? Like, uh, not, I mean, they can be personal, but like, um, about artists? I'm not really. Yeah, I got one about it. myself for, from two hours ago. <laughs> 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 uh, I set up my mic for the, this podcast. <laughs> and, then I, I went, and then I went for a walk, and then came back and started the doing the podcast. What drugs did you do? And then I that's why I I simply went for a walk and occasionally <laughs> sipped my water. You got high on life. High on life, the best kind of. I went outside with my. That's not a drug, nerd. Jazz is the worst drug of them all. Not even once. Jazz, not even once. Sky is the superior. Oh boy. All right. Just ended on that. Sky is superior. That would be the title of this one. Thank, thank you for the the sky posting of of. Oh, shit. <laughs> the the Scott po- or the oh, Scott yeah, I messed it up too. To the, the fedora the posting, posting of Scott to, to come. Yeah. S- Jazz is the poor man's Scott. It's the loser's Scott. Oh man, guys, what do you, what do you think, Scott? J- like, Scott if Jazz. okay, here's 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 a fun thing. Here's a fun thing. So, what would you say if you were to describe a genre? Or subgenre with a drug. What would you describe it as? Which one? Ska. So, uh, yeah, yeah, ska would be. What would what do you think ska would be? Mm-hmm. Damn, I don't know. Do ska kids like do drugs? What kind of drugs do dads take? No, <laughs> yeah, no. Ska is just like when you drink like a bunch of pops with your friends when you're 12 years old and you have a sleepover, <laughs> and you're like, you think you're such a badass at like two in the morning because you got to stay up. Scott and you're just is like sugar rocking hunt. out. Yeah, that's what Scott Yeah, pop is. rocks. Yeah, pop <laughs> rocks. Like, dude, check out these drugs. <laughs> the drug that Scott is is caffeine. Yeah. That, yeah it's technically I, a drug. Yeah. I, I can see that. I take it. Like, Scott is what skaters can't have listen Scott. to. They just drink a bunch of Monster and Red Bull and just listen to Scott and <laughs> rip some ramps. <laughs> Yeah, like like what's pop punk's drug? Uh, soda. Teenage All right. angst. Well, I think. <laughs> well, that that's that's like oh man, I had that period. That was the the jazz. That was before I discovered jazz and went oh. full full. I, yeah, I tried to rebel with jazz. I guess not really, but like I was in that period where most teenagers rebel, and I. And my, I remember my parents saying, "It's just a phase. He'll get, he'll grow out of it." <laughs> just me listening to jazz, like stuff older than my parents listened to. I'm like, "Oh, it's killing me!" Where did you learn oh, to play man. that? Wait, lick? I learned it from you. <laughs> just, and it wasn't, it wasn't just a phase. Just like drugs, it stayed with me forever. I am an, once I, once I became addicted, I was an addict for life. And it sucks. And now you go to high school. Because jazz is awful. All right. So this has been the Woodshed Podcast. Drug addiction. No condonation. Did you mean drug addiction? uh, With Tyler. Hi. Tanner. What's up? Donnie. Howdy. (laughs) And Daniel. Let's jam. (laughs) All right. We'll catch you guys next week on our non-drug, maybe still drug podcast. Who knows? Be sure to subscribe to NPR. (laughs) Tiny desk. (laughs)